when you think of cereal, more often than not, you don't really think of Wheaties or Life or even Quaker Oats or something like that. Not at first, anyway. Usually, if you're anything like me, your mind goes to something like Fruit Loops or Captain Crunch or a Frosted Flakes or something like that. And there's a reason that happens. Number one, it's because the cereal companies purposely make their packaging stand out. And their marketing uh, usually focuses on their bright and colorful characters. So they stand out, but more importantly, those characters and the marketing in general appeals to us from a very young age. And that's kind of the focus on this video because quite a while back, this advertising wasn't really as pronounced because these cereal companies actually used to advertise within cartoons themselves, rather than relying on Toucan Sam or Tony the Tiger. They actually embedded their ads right in television cartoons. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. To really start with this, we have to go back all the way to just after World War II. And that was a very prosperous time in North America, where TVs were beginning to be introduced, and there was a lot more uh, prosperity in general. Salaries were up, people were moving out to suburbs, free time was at a high. The economy was in general skyrocketing. And with that came the rise of advertising, because you had TV and you know the rise of commercials. So this made a very ideal market for cereal companies to begin pushing their wares onto the American public and the Canadian public. This led to these companies being quite active on the popular shows of the day. Usually that would be sitcoms, for example, or westerns especially. And these were live action, very popular live action shows with dozens of millions of viewers every day or every week. And as the 40s and 50s went on, they started advertising on cartoons as well. Now at first, cartoons on TV were just reruns of the theatrical shorts, uh, you know, like the Looney Tunes and the Donald Ducks of the 40s and 30s. But as with most uh, television programs, cartoons eventually began to be sponsored by these serial companies and advertisers in general. But you know, cereal companies are kind of the focus of this video. And they were and they were actually one of the bigger ones. So yeah, just a primer on this. Back in the 50s, it was common for TV shows to come into existence specifically because they were sponsored by a specific advertiser, in this case, cereals. So basically what would happen is the cereal company would pay for the show to be made. And in return for that, for those production dollars, they'd get special treatment in the form of ads embedded in the content of the show itself. And this is very common in Westerns, where the character would actually, for lack of a better term, shill the serial in the program itself. Sometimes it would be as low-key as just appearing in the opening and closing credits. In any case, this uh, model was also used for cartoons, to the point where a lot of cartoons owe their existence to Kellogg's or General Mills or Post. A good example would be the very famous Huckleberry Hound. So Huckleberry Hound was sponsored by uh, Kellogg's and you can see in the opening and closing credits, there's a very not so subtle Kellogg's just front and center. And the same thing applied to another very popular show at the time, uh, Quick Draw McGraw, a Western themed cartoon which also featured the very prominent Kellogg's in the opening and closing credits. And these shows were actually both Hanna-Barbera shows, which was a very, very active cartoon studio at this time. They made Tom and Jerry before TV really took off, but once TV was a thing, they made Huckleberry Hound, uh, The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, Quick Draw McGraw again, and dozens of other ones, you know, Scooby-Doo, uh, Josie and the Pussycats, the, it goes on with this studio. They had a very lucrative uh, partnership with Kellogg's. 
so obviously Kellogg's paid for a lot of their cartoons. Yogi Bear especially was, at one point, a Kellogg's spokesperson. He actually appeared in commercials with Kellogg's, in addition to being sponsored by Kellogg's on his own program. He was really a spokesman in his own right. It's pretty, it's almost otherworldly these days. These cartoons back in the 50s and 60s, they may look a bit dated nowadays, but these were crazy popular. Like these got tens of millions of viewers across the US, across Canada, Europe, Japan. Like this was next level popularity because there was only a few choices on TV in the first place. And as luck would have it, a lot of the audiences that these programs drew were in fact children. And those children were the prime targets for serial companies to take advantage of. Because, you know, if you saw Yogi advertise a Kellogg's cereal, and then you saw it in the store, then as a kid you'd be like, I'm seeing Yogi here on the box, and I'm seeing Yogi on TV. Well, that can only mean one thing. We're eating good tonight, or this morning. It was very lucrative for serial companies, and for quite a while had the pick of the litter because they had all this advertising space in the form of Saturday morning cartoons, and they had uh, a lot of little eyeballs to take advantage of. So for quite a while, it was quite cushy for these companies, but it was not a scenario that would last. And the main reason is that over time, these companies, they got carried away. See, at first, it would be a simple shout out in the show, or maybe like the cartoon characters, like let's say Rocky and Bullwinkle, for tricks would do something very inconspicuous, you could say. The point was to be conspicuous, but more in the sense of it's not really the point of the program. But over the years, a lot of cartoons, they really became almost about the serial. There was this one TV show, a cartoon, it's called Linus the Lionhearted. It was sponsored by Post. And this cartoon it was so egregious, it was basically a half hour commercial for cereal because the mascot, or I mean the protagonist, huh, quotes, Linus became the mascot for a cereal called Country Critters. And then his supporting cast, each of them became mascots for their own brand of cereal, like Sugar Crisp or Alphabet Cereal and so on. It got so bad with this cartoon that the FCC directly intervened in 1969 and made a rule saying that a cartoon character cannot appear during the time this program is airing. And once they made that rule, shows like Linus the Lionhearted were, they had to be canceled outright because there was no divorcing the character that the studio made, Linus, and uh, the serial that was the whole point of the show. And so as the years went on, going in from the late 60s into the early 70s, the practice kind of lost popularity, but it was still very much widespread. But in the 1970s, an advocacy group called the Action for Children's Television, it was kind of like a, a parent group that really advocated for children's rights. At first, they kind of fought against really violent cartoons, but eventually they moved into advocating against advertising in children's cartoons. And you know, they wanted more educational programming. But in the 1970s, their focus turned to cereal advertising. They wanted to kind of make sure that this very sugary cereal was not being marketed to exploitable young kids. They really started their activism in the 70s. And one thing led to another. They didn't get legislation at that point in the 70s, but really the message in society, it kind of permeated through society. And it led to less and less of this embedding of cartoon characters and cereal. You basically saw less cartoon characters shilling the cereal, not as much as you would have in the 60s anyway. But the practice remained widespread. During the 70s, the cereal companies started to see how society was slowly shifting against this kind of advertising. So they started to lean back into their original mascots you know, the Captain Crunches, the Toucan Sams, the Trix Rabbits, the Tony the Tigers. They were original characters, and they started making commercials to air, you know, still during cartoons, 
but separate from the content. So just like we have today. You know, so they made their own storylines, their own lore, so to speak. And they really developed their own worlds. Like you had Tony the Tiger's athletic personality, or Toucan Sam's three nephews, or the Trix Rabbit and his eternal quest for cereal that the kids would never give him for some reason. And that really kept them apart from the actual content of these kids' shows. Even though cereal companies, even today, they still buy ad space during cartoon, during kids' shows. It's just, you know, it's unavoidable. So by the end of the 1980s, the Action for Children's Television, again, ACT, that parents group, their campaign continued to catch steam. And in 1990, George H.W. Bush, the first Bush, signed into law the Children's Television Act. And this was an act, a law that forced television stations to carefully separate advertising and children's programming. Most of what it did was actually to limit advertising time during children's programming, but it also ended up affecting serial advertising as a whole, because suddenly you had to clearly delineate the show from its advertising. If you've ever seen something like a message right before commercial, like, um, we'll be right back after these messages, or, and here's a word from our sponsors. That, that's the kind of thing that was encouraged by the Television Act. It basically forced more ethics into children's programming. So when you see these bumpers today, whether it be on a kid's show or not, that's the reason that they're there, to clearly separate the content, the programming itself, from these ads. So over the 1990s and into the 2000s, there was less and less incidents of children's animated programs being host to this embedded advertising. The practice really wore out, and by the 2000s, it was basically extinct, thanks to government regulation. And also, you know, society itself, it just wasn't up to that anymore. Cartoons got more and more sophisticated to make, and they also found homes on cable uh, television stations like Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network, which also meant that the originators of the serial advertising phenomenon, which is the broadcasting stations like ABC and NBC and CBS, they kind of lost that market of, of kids. And on the cable channels, there was way less rules. So a lot of bigger companies kind of pushed out the serial companies uh, on those channels. Not to say that there was no serial commercial at all, it's just that they just became another advertiser on these stations. And today, well, the mascots themselves, they're still big business, they're still very popular, and they're still like a big way to sell these sugary snacks, I should call them, to kids. But they're falling under increasing scrutiny by governments around the world. There's a lot of calls for them to be either restricted or banned in like Europe or Canada, and even some places in the United States, just because that they're so good at selling kids junk food, pretty much. And as for the Huckleberry Hounds and the Yogi Bears of old, companies don't really sponsor cartoons like that anymore, so I think that era is long past us, and for good reason. I've maintained before that the embedded advertising era was a very bad thing for animation and we got to know that even by the time that I was born it was pretty much gone. So yeah I just wanted to talk a little bit about animation and serial and uh, that's kind of it. If you enjoyed my spiel then please like and subscribe and do ring that bell and I'll be seeing you soon.